Hello, everyone. My name is Miss Pam, and I work at the Billie Jean King Main Library, and just wanted to say hi. <laughs> and I'm Janine from Mark Twain Library. Welcome to Chapter Chat, our monthly conversation highlighting new books from our elementary and middle school collections, airing the second Wednesday of every month. We will each talk about four new books that have arrived on our shelves within the last six months. Let's begin and we will start with you, Pam, take it away. All right, my first book is called The Lion of Mars by Jennifer L. Holm. And this is set in the year 2091. This is the story of Bell, he's 11 and he lives on Mars. He spent his entire life there along with a few other kids and they're all orphans. They were brought up to Mars by people who were on their way to work at the space stations up there, the colonies. So they've never known what it's like to live on Earth. They just can watch movies or ask the adults what it was like, but it's a very structured life. They have a lot of rules, of course, for safety. Most of their food is made from algae mm. and yeah. And the most exciting thing is when a supply ship comes because they can uh, put in a wish list of things that they want. But um, it's a very, it's kind of a boring life because they know there's other colonies out there from other countries, but they're forbidden from having any contact with them. And they're never told why. But when the adults start getting sick and the kids can't help them, they can't figure out what it is, they have to go to the other colonies to get help. And when they do, then they meet the kids from the other places and they, they have new friends from Finland and Russia and France. And they get a taste of what it's really like to, um, to have friends besides themselves, not have to just be by themselves. But, um, and even the adults get into the act and they reconnect with the adults in the other colonies. But then they get a directive from Earth that says, oh, no, no more, no more contact. And after that, everyone's, everyone's really, really depressed. And the kids try and find out, you know, what's going on? How can we make this better? And when they do, it's like, really, grownups, come on. Um, but it's, it's a really um, unique look at what it would be like to grow up on another planet and it's not always the glorious adventure that people think that it just might be. Just often just to focus on surviving from day to day. But the kids are all um, unique. One really is into fashion. One's kind of a whiner. Bell is kind of the catalyst for everything, even though he's the youngest. But this is a really, um, really fun book for people who are interested in space. So. Lion of Mars by Jennifer L. Holm. Mm, very cool, very cool. Mm -hmm. I'm always like interested in like the space, like sci-fi type stuff too. So yeah. that seems pretty fun, not bad. I'll have to add it to the list. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> the ongoing list. Yes. Yay. So um, my first book is this oh. one. Yeah. Clues to the Universe by Christina Lee. I think Lee. Um, this is a children's fiction novel, and this came on our shelves at, on May, in May or the, uh, last month uh, this year. So <clears throat> this book is about two unique individuals, uh, Rosalind Ling Garrity, or Ro, as she goes by, has always loved watching NASA launches and building rockets and anything that has to do with space but she especially loved all, doing all those things with her dad until he unexpectedly passed away. That was really, really hard for her, it still is as, as well. The only thing she has left of him is uh, <clears throat> an unfinished model rocket that they were working on together. Life is quite difficult for Ro, not only because uh, seventh, she's exper also experiencing seventh grade in a new school, um, where everyone is trying to figure out what her biracial ethnicity is, and, which is half Chinese and half Caucasian. Mm. And so that's Ro, and she, it's a tough time for her, but there's another unique individual, Benjamin Burrs, Burns, or Benji, they, that's what he goes by, 
Um, he also has it tough too. He comes from a broken home, broken family home after his father had walked out on him and his family. On top of mm -hmm. that, Benji's best friend, Amir, just recently moved across the country, leaving Benji feeling very sad and alone, very lonely. And, and so Benji is almost the complete opposite as Ro and is not a fan of science, but he can't get enough of this comic book series, very popular comic book series called Spacebound, which he thinks was written by his father and is trying to communicate with Benji um, mm -hmm. through the story. He kind of finds, uh, I believe he finds a, a a drawing or something that kind of indicates that his father might have actually written the whole series. So this is set in the 1980s in Sacramento, California. Um, these two seventh graders accidentally swapped photos, swapped photos, uh, folders, <laughs> forcing them to meet and become uh, an unlikely pair of friends who mm. partner up to complete Rose model rocket the unfinished model rocket that her and her father were working on. And also they plan to search for Benji's father. Of course, these are not easy tasks to accomplish. This is the 80s, so there's no internet. There's no Facebook. There's, you know, it's a lot harder to search for people. So, um, but, uh, you know, of course, though, uh, there is some hesitation from Benji um, when he wants to find his father. He's very hesitant, obviously you could probably imagine. Well, he left him, so, you know, clearly he doesn't want anything to do with him, things like that. But this irritates Ro, obviously, um, because she would give anything to see her father again. But of course you can imagine it's, there's a dynamic there, <laughs> a little bit of a clash. They need to somehow try and understand each other's differences. And, you know, they need to really put their perspectives into each other's perspectives, you know, so. So um, as these two experience sadness, grief, bullying, and all the challenges, they embark on a very, very difficult journey together. But hopefully it all works out in the end, but you never know unless you, come, unless you read it. <laughs> yeah, I saw that one, I just haven't haven't read it yet. Yeah, well, this beautiful. cover is going to disappear because it's green. Ah, oh and there's no. not much I can do about that. Well, that looks so this cool. is um, <laughs> this is JD and the Great Barber Battle by Jay Dillard, illustrated by Akeem S. Roberts. And this is the story of JD, who his family has a rule that they don't get um, a haircut until they're going into third grade. Her, his mom does their hair in, in cornrows. Mm. And so he's never had a haircut, but the night before third grade starts, she gives him his first haircut and she does a terrible job. And he's so embarrassed, he wears his hat to school, but everyone keeps making it take him off. And then they just laugh at him. And he's just so embarrassed. He's like, maybe I should try fixing this because he's watched, he's watched um, people do it and he knows what he's supposed to do. So he gets his mom's clippers and he goes, oh no, I think I'll practice on my little brother first. So he does, and he does a really good job. Oh, and then he goes, okay. okay, I can do mine. <laughs> and he fixes his hair and people are like, wow. So his friends, before he knows it, his friends are coming over to him and he's cutting their hair and they're paying him. Oh. And so he can buy candy and video games and things. And then, there is only one barber in town. They're in Meridian, Mississippi. And the barber's a little jealous because now these boys are not coming to him. But the, his shop only does three styles and none of them are really popular. So they go to JD and he, um, but the barber sends the health department after JD because he doesn't have a license. So JD decides, well, we need to have a contest to see who the best barber in town is. Mm -hmm. And um, he's studied all the styles. He can do them. He can even do the cut cutouts. Oh. And um, so they have a contest. I'm not going to tell you who wins. <laughs> but this has references to the unique styles of Patrick Mahomes and Steph Curry. And so it makes it really, really super current and yeah. very fun. And oh, cool. all the while I was thinking, He's nine. 
Uh, how, how does he know how to do this? But the author is a master barber and he started cutting his hair when he was 10. Really? So I guess it can be done. And just want to show one of the illustrations. There he is cutting his friend's oh. hair on their back porch. Oh, cute. He has his own chair and everything. Oh. He uses his mom's clippers. Yeah. So this is just a very fun book and I look forward to seeing what happens Oh, cool. after we find out who wins the contest yeah. so jd yeah. and the great barber battle very cool first first book by um jay dillard so yes. very well done how cool oh that's so cute <laughs> i like yeah it. i was wondering like oh my gosh if he's gonna clip his brother's hair i'm like oh my god <laughs> yeah yeah he can t it's a, it's amazing so cool that's so cool all right um and so my next one is <coughs> Amari and the Knight Brothers by B.B. Um, S. Alston. <laughs> B.B. Alston. So this one is on our children's fiction section and it came in on our shelves in April. So a couple months ago. And <clears throat> this book is so much like Men in Black. Uh, because I loved that movie and I also love the fantasy genre, this book is a must read for me. I'm going to totally finish it too. <laughs> I promise. I swear. But it's really, really, really fun. Um, in Amari Peters' home household, uh, she lives in a single parent home uh, with just her mother. And it, uh, it would usually be Amari her older brother, Quentin, and their mother, but Quentin has gone missing for over six months. And Amari refuses to believe that he's dead. His disappearance was so strange and odd because it happened after he had gone to summer leadership camp or summer leadership camp <laughs> and then started working for an agency with classified information which meant that he couldn't tell Amari or their mother where or what he does with the agency. So with no clues as to what happened to him, the police had given up for good, unfortunately. Amari almost feels, almost feels like all hope is lost until a strange man came to the door saying that he has a package to be delivered to her from her older brother, Quentin. So that's a little odd especially since you haven't heard from him <laughs> for six months. But only he didn't have a physical package to give to her right at that moment. Instead, he had her sign the tablet in his hand, just getting his, his signature, saying that she did receive the package. And then he said that the package is in Quentin's closet, where she finds a ticking briefcase and a nomination for a summer tryout at the Bureau of Supernatural Affairs. This top secret organization that allows business to be conducted between humans and other supernatural creatures peacefully. It's very, very top secret. And she must realize that this, she finally realizes that this must be the agency that Quentin worked for before he disappeared. She also thinks that this is where she'll find answers um, the finances about where is about his whereabouts and maybe find some clues to try and solve exactly what happened to him. Not only does she have to get used to the fact that there are supernatural beings like fairies, dragons and aliens, but she must also find her hidden enhanced ability, ignore all the bullying from all the other classmates, pass the tryouts and then find her brother all while <laughs> an evil a very powerful magician is threatening the supernatural world. Will she succeed? I don't know. You'll have to read it to find out. So it seems really fun. It's really cool. I, it's I, a I great like, cover. Yeah, I love the cover. It's so cool. And I'm like really excited to hear about her dragon roommate or, you know, read further. Yeah. Read I raced to finish it last night and it was, yeah. it has a great ending. I'm not going to spoil it. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. So on a totally different note, this is In a Flash by um, Donna Jo Napoli. And she writes a lot of historical um, books. 
Okay. And this is set in Japan in 1940. This is the story of Simona and Carolina. They are Italian, but their dad is like the world's best chef. And so the ambassador to Japan gives him a job in the embassy there. So they move to Tokyo and they leave behind their beloved Nona and all their friends and everything that they know. And then they have to learn a new language, learn a completely different culture. And they do um, after a couple of years, um, Simona is eight and Carolina is five when they move there. So they, they do a pretty good job of absorbing. And in 1943 though, the war comes to Tokyo and their dad is taking, all the foreigners are taken prisoner. And he's taken to one camp, the girls are taken to another. And um, they use their, their cleverness, their wits, they just, they don't give up and they manage to escape from the camp. And they kind of move from town to town and they find protectors along the way. And they're just, they just do whatever they can so that people won't realize that they're foreigners at one time they wrap cloths around their eyes to, so that people will think they're blind, so they can't see their eyes. And they've, they've gotten so good at the language that people don't realize that they're not Japanese because their hair is kind of dark and they, they look the part and they play the part very well. Um, oh. But their last stop is in Hiroshima and they get there not too long before the atomic bomb is, is dropped on the city. But um, oh, it's, wow. it's quite, it's so dramatic. And I just thought of all the research that um, the author had to do and she had to, she sprinkles in Italian and Italian customs and the whole Japanese culture oh. and the language and just, um, if you've ever wondered what it would be like to be a foreigner in another country during a war, when you're kind of considered the enemy, this is the book for you. Um, it's it, because of that, I, I, I think I might end up putting it in middle school. Right now it's in children's fiction, but just an amazing story. I think teachers would do well to recommend this if they're doing historical fiction. Wow, that's pretty so cool. well done. Yeah. I can't imagine like the things that the like trauma and the adjustments. Mm -hmm. Oh my gosh. That is yeah. tough. Man. Yeah. yeah. I need to add that one. Yes. Long list. <laughs> yeah. It's kind of it's kind of long. It's almost 400 pages, but oh wow. It's yeah. It's a good read. Yeah. Probably definitely middle school then. I think so. I think so. This subject even though the girls are Young when they start, obviously they age and. Mm -hmm. Interesting. Okay, well, since you you might change the se section as well. <laughs> oh, <laughs> I think it's uh, fitting that I talk about this one. Um, I read this one or I listened to it, and um, because of how the story <coughs> goes, and there. 13 years old the, the main protagonists are but I think maybe it should probably be more in teens the the way how the story flows I'm, I'm not too sure if middle schoolers would be interested but it is in our uh collection it's uh, in their scary stories collection it kind of looks kind of creepy and scary yeah yeah and so um <clears throat> this book basically is about uh two 13 year olds uh quinn and mike you can see them on the cover um and they live i i believe that it said um in new haven or something like that i think more towards the east coast and they live on a street called goody lane uh so everything is really great and everything in that neighborhood except their neighbors so Quinn and Mike, they're actually next door neighbors, but all the other neighbors on that street, they are very, very strange. They act kind of in unison. They mm. seem to like not have much expression or emotion, or if they did, they all kind of have the same expression, like all across the board. They all do the same things. It's kind mm. of like, it reminds me of like, um, kind of like a, one of those like 
robotic type neighbor, yeah. you know, like where, the Stepford wives. Yeah. Or something. Yeah. Or like, yeah, like kind of like Pleasantville, you know, something like that. Oh, yeah. Yeah. You know, just everything is just done the same. It's so weird. Anyway, so it's kind of creepy. Well, Quinn's father lo- used to think of stories and theories of what what's going on with them, why they act this way. Um, so he likes to he liked to, to bring up uh, theories like maybe they're immortal, maybe they maybe they have a spell on them, or maybe they <laughs> there's just so many different theories, or maybe they're and yeah, so it's very interesting. But unfortunately, uh, Quinn's father actually died a year ago. Mm. And life has been hard. But even though her father did um, pass away, he used to be a police officer as well. So he, that true detective part of him came out, comes out a lot. Well, Quinn and Mike um, decide they want to continue this investigation, kind of like follow in, their fa- in her father's footsteps and keep it going. But the things that they do know as they investigate is they, all these neighbors, they never age. It's almost as if they age backwards. Ooh. Yeah. Um, one big, big thing that really freaked them out, and it kind of was a little creepy too, was one of the neighbors, Mr. Brown, he actually was very um, feeble. He was very weak. He was, he, they're all, they're, they're almost like elderly. They're all retired and everything like that. And he was able, to, he's barely able to walk like from his front porch to like the car, you know, one week. And then next thing you know, they see him sprinting past them on the sidewalk. Mm. And what's even creepier is that uh, Mr. Brown, the back of his leg, he has a scar. It's like, I think they said that it's the shape of Florida kind of. Oh. And the reason why they know that scar is because Quinn's dad used to have the exact same scar. Mm. I know. And so it's kind of very creepy. So they're trying to figure out how is this reverse like aging process work? I don't understand. They don't understand. Quinn thinks to, she thinks that it's something supernatural, maybe something with magic. And Mike, he's more of a uh, non, he's not really a believer in magic and supernatural stuff. He thinks that there's always a reason. There's always a reason why and he uses science to investigate. So he thinks it's all science, maybe a new <laughs> Botox or maybe a new <laughs> medical drug that they probably discovered. So as they decide to go ahead with their hypothesis, <laughs> they kind of go through the steps of investigation. But the more they investigate, the more they find out that they're actually more involved in this whole scheme um, as as the book goes on, as you read. So as you read, they become more and more in grave danger. So it's kind of like when the villain finds out that you are finding out things. (laughs) Yeah. You know, then you get into real trouble, kind of like that. But anyways, so. I highly recommend this, but I have a feeling I might, I might suggest putting it in the teen section, but definitely here, I think we'll see how it goes in the scary story section. So yeah, a bit creepy. Wow. (laughs) Yeah. Well, speaking of creepy, my last book is Hide and Seeker by Jacob Herman. Cool. (coughs) Excuse me. This is a story of Justin and his friends. They've gathered to welcome back their friend Z. He's been missing for a year and all of a sudden he's back, but he's different. He's very angry, he's very destructive and he speaks in creepy rhymes. He never obviously did that before. So while they're waiting for the party to start, they decide to play hide and seek and they have specific rules and the penalty for breaking the rules this time turns out to be pretty horrific because one by one, Justin and his friends disappear. And where they end up is a place called Nowhere, which is run by this mysterious creature. You can see him in the back there Mm -hmm. called the Seeker. Mm -hmm. And it's just, they meet other kids there, kids who've been missing for decades. 
and the most awful thing, well, they realized that Z was one of them, but somehow he was able to return. But once they're there, the seeker, when he gets angry with them, he forces them to relive their worst fears over and over and over again. And so Justin and his friends, they have to band together and they want to try and get the other kids to help them try and defeat the seeker so that they can go back home and break his power. But this is just the scariest book. And um, I, I listened, to, I watched an interview with the author and she said when she saw the cover, it almost gave her nightmares. Whoa. Because even though she writes horror stories, she uh -huh. doesn't like horror movies. Really? And she's a bit of a scaredy cat, but she oh. started writing this as a fantasy and they said, no, 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 it's it's a horror story. Yeah. So um, she and her cousins, she has the chant in there that they used when they played hide and go seek. And it, it wasn't just you count to 10, ready or not, here I come. It was, I went up the hill, the hill was muddy, stomped my toe and made it bloody. Should I wash it? <laughs> and if the seeker hears yes, you know, they need more time to hide. So you keep doing the chant oh, until you don't hear any answers. Of, and then you know everybody's hidden. Oh. So she went back home. She said, we used to play hide and seek at her grandmother's in Knoxville, Tennessee. And she said, where in the world did this chant come from? It's really yeah. spooky. And, yeah. and none of them knew. But that oh. was the chant that they always used. So um, anyway, it's really scary. Yeah. And she may write another book about how the seeker became the seeker. Ooh, but like Justin, prequel. yeah. So Ooh. Justin, um, he's a great character because he doesn't want to give up. Mm -hmm. And all of his friends, he gets them to be a team. And it's just super spooky. But yeah, it kind of very reminds emotional. Me. Very emotional. Oh, yeah. If you're, you're reading oh, yeah. this, you're thinking, what is my greatest fear? I oh, know. Gosh. Yeah. It kind of reminds me of um like get out or um and stranger things yeah oh man yeah so if you like scary things this is it wow i actually that was one of the options for me i was thinking about doing that one but i decided to do the stitchers instead so but i i read the synopsis of it and i was like oh this is interesting yeah oh i don't know though if i could handle it i know oh okay so my last book um, this one is called 13 Witches, The mm. Memory, yeah, by Jody Lynn Anderson. Mm. So this one is on, in our middle school fiction section. It's a fantasy novel. And this, these are, this arrived on our shelves uh, in April, so a couple months ago. So this book uh, is about Rosie Oaks. Uh, even though 12-year-old Rosie Oaks lives with her mother, Rosie still feels like she's all alone. Her mother is missing whatever it is that makes mothers love their daughters. She's kind of like a blank slate in a way. Um, ever since Rosie was born, her mother has lived a very scheduled life where Rosie would have, would have to set alarms for her to remind her just to eat, sleep, and then work. Wow. Yeah, it's very interesting. She, she's just like a like literally blank stare all the time, but she's able to function and work, you know, in real life, but it's still the emotional, there's a definite emotional distance between both of them. Uh, whenever Rosie would attempt to talk to her mom about something, she would barely give a response um, or look very blank. She'd be even be lucky if she even says like one or two words to respond to her. Rosie has experienced this very neglectful life for many, many years and has always turned to stories and storytelling for comfort. Ones that were written by her and created by her, and they always had a happy ending. But once they started sixth grade, Rosie came to the realization that she should move on from storytelling and <clears throat> focus on making new friends other than her best friend, her closest friend, uh, Jenna, who she calls Germ, <laughs> she got that nickname as like when one of the bullies in school actually happened to 
call her that, but it was only like basically her nickname for her, like Rosie's nickname for her because they were good friends. And so she decided to basically raid her closet and take all the stories that she's ever written all her life. And she went into the backyard and burned them all. But uh, little did she know that this would inadvertently allow her to see ghosts in her own home. Mm. Weird. Apparently when Rosie burned her stories to push magic and imagination away, magic, will, magic tends to find a way back to you. So she was basically closing one door and opening a window and or opening another door which brought her the ability to see spirits they so um <clears throat> these ghosts approach rosie and germ and they tell them that they're in grave danger um, but first things first they must read the witch hunter's guide to the universe which is that book right there a brown leather bound book and <clears throat> this book as previously owned by Rosie's mother, who was actually, who's actually the last known witch hunter. Mm. Rosie didn't know that. So, but the book informs the reader that all of the evil in the world stems from 13 witches who are unseen and also unstoppable. And one of these witches is named the memory thief, just like the title. Mm. The memory thief, as you could probably can figure out, has the ability to steal a person's precious memories and has actually stolen her mother's memories on the night of Rosie's birth. Uh -huh. So this probably explains her mother's neglectful behavior, um, how she always looks blank. She's always looking in the distant, uh, distance and barely responding to Rosie. Well, now that Rosie has been introduced to this strange new supernatural world, she must do all that she can to discover her magical abilities and follow in her mother's footsteps and defeat the memory thief. Hopefully she'll find a way to get her mother's memories back to her. Will Rosie be able to have a happy ending just like all the stories that she's created? Well, this book is the first in a trilogy. So we probably won't know until the third book, mm. but at least there will be two more. <laughs> I was wondering if there would be 13. Yeah, I know, right? <laughs> and I was like thinking like, well, I don't know, maybe that'd be interesting. That'd be a long yeah. series though. <laughs> yeah. But, yeah. All, All right. right. Well, that's well like, what a great mix of books once again. Yeah. Something for everybody, I think. Mm -hmm. um, just wanted to remind you that if you want to find these books on our catalog, just look under chapter chat 0621. And just a little reminder, plug for our summer reading program, Reading Colors Your World. Start, starts on June 19th. There's actually an online uh, virtual event with performers on that day at 11 o'clock on our Facebook page. So if you want more information, you can call the library, visit the libraries that are open, and everything will be pretty much online but it's going to be fun. We're going to have programs every week for all ages and it's going to be really great. So we encourage you to be part of that. So thanks, Janine. It's been a, another fun time of sharing yeah. books, creepy know. and other. I know. I know. Very interesting books this, this month. <laughs> yeah. All righty. Okay. So we'll see you next month. Yeah. See you then. All right. Bye. Bye.